So the, the four Gospels are a unique animal. Um, there's, there's similarities amongst them. There's differences. You know, when we look at the Gospel of John, which we just read, um, it's a unique text to pick for a Christmas Eve sermon. And we'll get, to, we'll get to why in a second. But each Gospel takes a different approach to how it unpacks the birth narrative of our Savior. And so we pick, sometimes we read from Luke, sometimes we read from Matthew. Today it was Luke. We generally get into some prophecies, but each of them have their own unique approach, and that's because they have their own unique people that they're writing to, purpose that they're writing towards. And so, for instance, when we look at the book of Mark, Mark is a concise guy, right? He's kind of a no-hold-back, just throw it out, not a whole lot of words, it's shorter. And so Mark starts right with John the Baptist. We get into Mark, and here's John, and then the birth narrative comes out, right? When we get to Luke, Luke's a researcher, right? He's kind of a little more... On the, on the edge of it. And so he wants to find out a little more. So he starts his birth narrative with looking at John the Baptist's parents. Matthew is talking to a Jewish audience. And so Matthew goes even further back and he hits the genealogy of Jesus. And so Matthew starts with Abraham because Abraham was in some ways considered, right, the father of, of God's people, right? From him, the descendants as numerous as the stars were made. And so we get to Matthew, and he's giving us this whole account to show his audience, look, this Messiah has come all the way from Abraham down through David and so forth. John's the weird guy. John takes a different approach. John starts at the very beginning, right? What does it say? In the beginning, he tells us. That echoes something. We've heard that before, right? In Genesis 1, the opening of all of Scripture, in the beginning, God created Right? And so John is trying to take it back to all the way in the beginning. And his writing is beautiful. I don't know about you. I, I don't know that there is a whole lot in Scripture that is just more pretty to read than John 1, 1 through 18. Right? I could read that over and over and over again daily. John has this way of just writing in a, in a concise but yet beautiful poetic way to get his point across. And John is hands down my favorite gospel. Here's what, here's what he says. We just read it a second ago. But let's take a look. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here's where he starts. And John is very unique in this. He doesn't even give us a birth narrative. And so you might ask, why on earth would this crazy pastor pick the one gospel that doesn't actually talk about the birth of Christ to preach on Christmas Eve as we come together to celebrate the birth of Christ? And to understand that, We have to understand that John is after a much bigger picture than just the birth story of that night. John is going way further and way deeper and way wider in a sense. And to understand his approach, we have to look at his context. And so number one, we have to know who is John talking to. And number two, we have to know what is John's main purpose in his whole gospel that he opens this set of verses with. And so John... As some are talking to Jews and some are talking to Greeks, John is talking to both. He's trying to hit at two people at once. And then because of that, he has one singular goal. He wants the reader to fully understand wholly who Jesus is. Not H-O-L-I, but W-H-O-L, right? Wholly who Jesus is. He doesn't just want to look at Jesus, the baby born in a manger, and that's a beautiful picture, and that is, in fact, who our Jesus is. But John wants us to get a few things beyond that. He wants you to know exactly who it is that you are worshiping as your Lord and Savior, hopefully. And so he opens with this way. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. They focus on other Gospels, how Jesus entered the world. John introduces Jesus like as the one who was already there before anything, right? And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, here is the birth of Jesus Christ. John just presumes that Christ was born. And John starts from the beginning and just assumes that he always has been. Jesus, to John, is not the one who was born into the world, but the one who preceded the world and the one who created all things. Here's what he's saying. Before the baby was the person, And he has always been. The birth of Jesus is not when we get introduced to Christ in the gospel narrative. Right? When God created in seven days, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together created. And Jesus was a part of it. He is, after all, 
the word. And if that sounds obvious to you, that's great. You're ahead of the curve. Congratulations. But this has implications, not on John's audience alone, but on us today too. I think this is something that we intrinsically know, but we don't really think about what it means. And so here's, as I mentioned, John is writing to Jews and Greeks. And for the Jews, this opening is immensely critical because it goes back to the Genesis they know. Right? For them, they know the, the story of the biblical narrative. They have walked, they have been the Israelites, the people of God. They have heard the tales of exile of the generations past. They know their scripture. They know the Lord through the Old Testament. And they have this promised Messiah that they are waiting for. And so for the Jewish people, John connects to them by talking about Jesus as the word that God spoke in Genesis 1. Right? That's how he brings them to it. For the Gentiles, he has a different idea. He uses this, this word, word. Right? And in Greek, that's logos. But in the Greek kind of the culture and philosophy, this idea of logos was more than just like word. Like here is a bunch of words on a page. For Greeks, it was this kind of cosmic, non-personal force that made everything happen. The logos was this, this way, right? We almost think like Star Wars, like the force. It's not a person. It's just things just kind of happen. It's the cause of things. And so for Greeks, when John uses the word, when he says Jesus is the word, he's saying Jesus is this force that you think is making everything happen. It's not just thin air. It's, it's a person, and that person is Jesus, and that person has always existed, even before the beginning of time. So how does that shape our culture today? We live in a world that operates as if we, or at least mankind in general, maybe we're not all individually as selfish, are the center of the universe. Right? You are the center of your own domain, the king of your castle. Right? The world revolves around you, and you might not think this out loud, but we certainly live that way. And if you, you want to say, well, we don't live that way, the culture at least does, and I would argue you do too, as do I. Right? That's because sin stains us and how we are meant to be. And so we have this selfishness, this self-centeredness. And in modern thinking, belief systems, faith, and morality, they are all man-made constructs. That's why morality is under attack in the world that we live in today. Because people are arguing that it's something that we made up. We constructed this stuff for the betterment of whatever. Religion is something that someone way back 5,000 years ago or whatever made up so that all of us would act and live as better people. Right? It's a moralistic thing. It's great. If we believe in this Jesus thing, then we'll all be nicer to each other. We'll give to the poor around Christmas time. And we'll do all these things. Right? That's, it's constructed as man-made stuff. And faith has to fit neatly into the box of our lives. Because we are, after all, the centers of our own universe. Right? And I wish that I could say that it's the world, but the church is equally culpable in this. And, and here's how we see some of this. In the last century, not that this is news or even news from Scripture's time frame, but we've seen the rise of, of what we call this prosperity gospel or health and wealth gospel. You might have heard of that. Right? Health and wealth gospel essentially will tell us this. If you, you can claim health and wealth for yourself through, through the right amount of faith, Right? Jesus wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And if you aren't happy, healthy, or wealthy, well, that's because you haven't had enough faith. You need to have more, preferably with your wallet to our church. <laughs> right? What's the best way to show that you have faith? Give us $1,000, and the Lord will give you ten. Right? That's what the prosperity gospel says. So you see, this idea of me-centeredness has even permeated the church in the world today, and we see it everywhere, right? We don't necessarily see it that subtly, like I'm not going to get up here and sell you some miracle cloth that will heal you for $1,000, although that is happening in churches around the world today, but that is something that we start to wrestle with. We have this idea that Jesus just wants us all to be happy and healthy and wonderful because we are the center. Do you hear it? Jesus doesn't become our Lord and, and reigning Savior. Jesus becomes this kind of cosmic genie that serves man's interest in some way. Right? And this thinking becomes problematic. 
And so, you know, the, this prosperity gospel started probably sometime around, like, after World War II. You know, it kind of rose out of some Pentecostal type of scenarios. Not that all Pentecostalism is bad, but the health and wealth gospel came out of that in, in some contexts. And so what happened is, over time, Scripture starts to butt up against this belief, right? Because if you read your Bible for yourself, it becomes pretty glaringly obvious that the prosperity gospel is a false gospel, and so, really, we had two choices as a culture. We could either, A, turn and say, well, we were wrong about this. Scripture tells us differently. Or we could start to deconstruct Scripture. And so now we live in a culture where that is predominantly happening. And it has been happening for, for decades upon decades. One of my favorite ones, I was just talking about this the other day. One of my favorite examples of this is this thing called the Jesus Seminar. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. There was this thing in the 80s where a bunch of theologians got together and they were called the Jesus Seminar and they would gather and they started to talk about the historicity of Jesus. And they looked through scripture, there was about 150 of them, and they started to look through all the things that Jesus said or claimed about himself and they decided which one of them in scripture was true and which one was false. Just imagine just the audacity of 150 guys sitting in a room with all their intellect and smarts and looking through the Bible and critically evaluating it to decide what inside of it was actually true and what wasn't. Who do they think they are? But that's what happens in a world where man is center. If Jesus doesn't fit in your box, you either abandon him or you change him. And the world is rapidly changing who our Savior is. They are. He's becoming about us and not about him. And this is really all the theological, if you ever hear the phrase theological liberalism, that's all it is. If history of scripture does not fit my narrative, then change the history rather than change my narrative. And if you stop and think, number one, you've probably seen this places, if not even in your own life. And number two, once you see it, man, it, it is just painful how self-centered it really is, right? And so here's the harshness of it. In the midst of this, right, we see John coming in and absolutely destroying every hint of that. And he does it with this opening, right? Before you and your family and your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, before any of them were even so much as a thought, Jesus Christ was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I love the second verse on this, because he says this poetically and beautifully, and then I almost picture him going, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, in case you didn't get it, he was in the beginning with God, right? <laughs> like, I almost picture verse 2 being like this, in case you're that dense and don't understand what I just said, he was, he was there. And, and all the things that were made were made through him. And without him, not a single thing that was made that was made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. One single bit. This Jesus who God, who is God, made everything. Literally nothing is made without him. This Jesus is the source of all of our life. The breath in your lungs today is his breath. It's not yours. You only exist inside of the reality that is created by the word, by Jesus. I came to Christmas Eve to feel fuzzy inside, and he's putting me in my place. <laughs> we can feel fuzzy, but for the right reasons. See, this changes the order of things. Right? We are no longer the center of our own universe, but we are inside of the center of Jesus as the, as the center of the universe. He is the one who is the creator. He is the one who is called the king, the priest, the prophet, the savior, the Messiah. He is the one who created this world to be a certain way, and he is the one who got it back on track to what it needed to be after man screwed it up. He is the one who all of us order everything through. And so John, for the rest of this opening passage, gets into these two themes of light and of glory. And we'll look at both of these together. 
In verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then it talks about how he came in, but people didn't recognize him. right? And that people didn't follow him. And that people didn't want to be a part of him. But to all who did, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus is the true light. What does that mean? Sometimes the dictionary can help. The definition of light is this. The natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. That's what light is defined as. And so Jesus being the light means that Jesus is the means by which we are enabled to see. And what is it that we are enabled to see? The glory of God. We can see the glory of God. Through Jesus, through the lens of Christ come as our Savior, we are able to see who God is and who we are in light of them. And verse 18 is a key here. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Over the last few weeks, as we were leading up to Christmas Eve, we went through this series called Greater Than, and we were looking at the various people in Scripture hailed as great, and how Jesus just completely trumps them all. Right? We were seeing how he is this great one. And the idea of Scripture up to this point of Jesus' birth is this. The people are trying to understand and get back to God. They want what was in the garden back in the reality of daily life. That's all throughout scripture. People trying to get back to God. And no matter how they try, they keep failing. Why? Because they can't get to him. We have been stained by sin. We cannot approach God on our own. You can try all you may. It will not work. We have this distance that has been created, this chasm that has been created, because a perfect God cannot be near a sinful people. He is holy, he is set apart, he cannot bear it, and his justice and his wrath requires payment and requires that we die and spend time eternally separated from God. And we cannot see him for who he is because sin stains our eyes and covers them. That's why Isaiah 9 that we started with starts with what? The people in darkness. Right? And they've been given a light. We live in darkness apart from Jesus, but he is the light. He is the one that allows us and enables us to see. Right? In Reformed theology, we call this total depravity. We, we call, this is the idea that apart from the Lord calling you, from Jesus' work in your life, from the Holy Spirit intervening, you can't even come to God to ask him for forgiveness. Because your heart is so dark that it won't even allow you to do that. And so for years and years, the world rolled through chaos and they tried to fix it. They tried to rule themselves. They tried to have judges rule them. They tried to have kings rule them. They tried to have prophets to be able to rule them and speak into their lives. And nothing works over and over again until we get into this 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testaments where hope is just gone. And then we have a 15-year-old and a betrothed on a camel. I'm worried about my wife right now, but she's in a car. <laughs> At least she's not riding a camel, a donkey. Why did I say camel? Right? At least she's not going to Clint Cleveland on a donkey. That would be a little different, wouldn't it? Right? They're walking. They're trying to go get registered, and she has to give birth and she goes and gives birth in a cave. I, I love the way that the Savior enters. It's the most innocent of ways. He comes in as a helpless baby. Just, just think of that. He created every single person there. And every one of us here today. He made the cave. He made the town. He made the people that inhabit the town. He made the morality that guides the people that inhabit the town. He literally made everything, but he chooses to enter our humanity, our brokenness, our mess, in the midst of a helpless baby. On a dark night, with no fanfare or any attention, except for some shepherds 
and some magi that come and pay him honor because the angels come to them and call them to. And I think it's a beautiful thing that he enters our brokenness in the midst of that desperation and says, listen, I am here now. Things are going to be different. You're going to be able to see And John drives this point home throughout his whole gospel. I would encourage you, if you want a Christmas break activity, read the Gospel of John. Part of why Karen wanted to read that passage is because she had spent Advent reading the Gospel of John and was just lit up with excitement to come and read it because it is a beautiful book. In in the Gospel of John, they're not called miracles, they're called signs because Jesus is doing them to point to who he is. And he has these things in there called I am sayings. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection in the life. I am the good shepherd. This whole gospel drips with who he is so that we as his people, when it comes time to follow him, might just understand what it is that we are getting into. The Lord is not interested in being your cosmic genie. He's not interested in providing you with that new car or that new house, although he might. The Lord that we serve is interested in one thing. He's interested in displaying his glory. In the beginning of creation, when we were made, we were made in the image of God. Why? What does it mean to be made in the image? To reflect him. We were meant to be a reflection of the glory of God. You need to get this really clearly. God does not need us. We were not made because God was bored. We were not made because God was lonely. God had perfect relationship within the triune Godhead of Father, Son, and Spirit. We were created, this world was made, because his glory just overspilled into creation. Because it glorifies him. And when Jesus comes, he comes with a singular purpose. To glorify him. How? By redeeming us. By coming to this earth to be our high priest to sympathize with us, to understand what it means to walk in humanity's shoes because he loves us that much. The birth of Christ, as beautiful as it is when we sing about it, is humiliation to a God who does something like that at radical because he loves us that much. It's endless and boundless, the love that he has for us. And he calls us to do the same thing. This is the reason that he came. And so even as a helpless baby, you you see these glimpses where people early on start to catch the idea that Jesus is something greater. Um, I love in Luke 2, you know, we read the narrative right where we stopped. The next thing is where Mary and Joseph, they go to the temple for her purification, right? A woman was considered unclean for a certain amount of days after she gave birth. And so they go for this purification and they run into this guy named Simeon. And Simeon sees Jesus and he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation as he looks at Jesus that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Even as a baby, Simeon could recognize that he had seen his Savior in all his glorious light. And so ultimately what John is doing is he's previewing his whole gospel in this one beginning introductory passage. That God created the world to demonstrate his glory. That sin messes things up. That we are unable to see without him. And that Jesus came and entered the world by light, to be the light, and to show us the Father. And he died on the cross afterwards, and he destroyed darkness entirely. And through him, we have access to God. Through him, we can see. And Jesus calls us to do likewise. And so that's my challenge to you. As you go out from this place, how are we going to reflect the light How are we going to be light to other people so that they will be able to see? That's why you exist. You may think you exist primarily to get a good job and provide well for your family and make sure everybody stays healthy and save up for that Disney vacation. You exist to bring glory to God primarily. That's why you're here. 
And if you don't like it, hold tough. Because we do not get to change the narrative of humanity. Well, we sure try, but we don't get to change it. We are called to be that light that Jesus was. Because every one of us sitting here that follows him, every one of us sitting here that in the midst of sorrow and suffering and anxiety and pain and loss has our hope placed firmly in our Savior, does so because he came on this night so that it might be illumined to us 